Everyone can you hear me okay? Um, Nolana, yeah, you've just clicked recording, perfect. So this is the third week of our webinar series for the International Consortium of Prevention Wayfinding. Um, this week we're going to be talking about technology and we have four presenters with us today. Um, just to quickly mention that um, we have a hashtag, um, ICDW Summer Series. Uh, so we'd encourage you to, we're on Twitter, so if there's any conversation that you want to keep happening, then please go over to Twitter and keep it going over there. Quick disclaimer that uh, the opinions expressed by participants and, and um, presenters are of their own and not representative of the ICDW. Um, and just before we get started, Hello. a bit of housekeeping. Um, we're asking if people could mute their microphones when they're not speaking, please. Um, we are recording this webinar and the recording will be available via our website and also our YouTube channel. Um, and so Nolana does a good job of getting that uploaded pretty quickly after the webinar and we'll send it out by email when it's ready. We would ask everyone to just type their questions into the chat function um, throughout the presentation. You'll see today we're going to follow a little bit of a different format to the previous weeks if you joined us before. Um, but just typing your questions into the chat and maybe we'll open it up to discussion later and people could start um, coming in there. Uh, a quick recap. Um, our first webinar, our um, introductory webinar, we actually invited the speakers of the previous um, consortium and it was the Consortium for Dementia and Wandering and they did really groundbreaking research on um, trying to get this discussion started on people with dementia, the issue of going missing and how we can kind of, um, I suppose, not solve it, but find ways of understanding how that happens so that we can prevent it in the future. Um, so it was really interesting to get that first presentation to get a bit of historical context. Um, since then, the way we use language has changed a lot. So Nolana and I, um, we kind of sought their approval of the previous consortium to almost re rebirth the consortium, but um, in line with more inclusive language, we've called it the International Consortium of Dementia and Wayfinding. Um, and I think what makes it a little bit different this time is that um, Nolana and I am a PhD student uh, at University of Edinburgh, and Nolana is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Waterloo. So we're kind of led by early career researchers, and we're trying to be, make this consortium as inclusive as possible. So that we're not um, just researchers, we're trying to welcome people in the, the discussion from all different backgrounds, be it policing, um, third sector, we have people with lived experience, so we're trying to keep it as broad as possible. Last week we spoke about, um, we got the policing perspective, um, a couple of really interesting present presenters there, and the themes that were, we spoke a little bit about behavioral profiling and whether that was a possible thing that we could use to help with um, when people with dementia go missing. Um, we spoke about a case study of an actual uh, case from a policing perspective, from a search and rescue perspective, when a person with dementia went missing. And it really brought up some interesting discussion around um, how we support people after missing episodes have occurred, um, how we might prevent missing episodes and tools that we can use. So we spoke a little bit about the Herbert Protocol, um, which is a form that you can fill out. Uh, so that's an intervention we have in the UK and there might be similar things around the world. Um, and then we actually did speak quite a lot about um, technology and how it could be a solution. So it fits really nicely into the theme of today. Um, so next up we have Dahlia. Oh no, I'm going to quickly talk you through the overview. Um, as I said, we've changed the format a little bit. So we're going to go through all of our presenters one after the other and then we're going to hold the Q&A till the end. Um, so everyone's going to speak for about 10 minutes. Um, the, you'll see the third speaker, Siobhan. Siobhan was actually unable to join us today, but she sent me a recording, so I'm going to play that. Um, so yeah, this is why it's important to write your questions down or type them in the chat, and we're going to come back to them later for a wrap-up. Uh, so I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and maybe just while I introduce you, Dahlia, you could get your slides up. So sure. first up, we have Dahlia Hanna. Um, she's a PhD candidate in the Department of Computer Science in um, 
Ryerson University. And, oh, I've lost my notes now that I've seen your screen. Oops. So, um, Dahlia, I'll, let, I'll hand over to you and I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit and tell us about your research. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Katie and Alina, and everybody who uh, joining us today. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about uh, my latest uh, research, uh, and looking forward to hear about uh, all other research. Uh, so um, I'm Dahlia. I'm a PhD candidate, fourth year uh, PhD at the Department of Computer Science, part of the NCART lab, uh, which is uh, specifically for public safety, research in public safety. Um, we do a lot of, um, besides the drone research, there's a lot of robotics coming out of the same uh, research uh, lab. And, um, um, and that's it. Uh, our, our work is supported by AgeWell, which was so, we're so grateful and proud of. And um, I, everything is fine. I'll just proceed then to, to here. So today I wanted to talk about uh, a couple of research questions and the presentation today is based on two recent publications on data analysis and uh, algorithm design. Um, the main, the bigger picture of my research is about using drones in locating a missing person uh, with dementia, uh, how it is used and uh, what are the best practices uh, so what is the best design for an algorithm to uh, automate some of the search? Um, I'm not yet in a position to say we're going to automate everything. It has a lot of considerations. So just to consider. Uh, so uh, the two things that happened were data analysis and testing and verifications. And I was um, um, grateful to be working with uh, search managers and companies to do field tests in which we do uh, go to the field, uh, have a person mimicking somebody uh, wandering uh, or going missing, and then have a pilot and a search manager, and then we start tracking, finding that person. And I think Jamie is on the call. He helped us out in one of the searches uh, early on uh, from SAR1. Uh, we did another one um, uh, later on to do verification. So the way it was working, we did some testing, collecting data. Um, then we did uh, more testing. And then we, we finally did verification of the, the data collected on how to find um, a person wondering where they could be found. Uh, the data helped in understanding some behaviors. And we also uh, have to acknowledge that they also the experience of the people in the field, the, the search and rescue uh, managers and teams. Uh, were really important in terms of us to understand uh, the type of search and the way uh, we do the search. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the data analysis. The first um, um, uh, part, we did linear regression uh, on uh, about 3,300 uh, incident reports of lost person with dementia from an international uh, database. Um, and I looked at um, like what is the correlation between uh, where they last seen, where there's evidence of their last seen, and um, all the other factors, which we call them the independent variables. And to, well, I guess nobody's surprised, there was no that much, like it's very low correlation. So the, the dark blue means that there's really not that much correlation between these independent uh, variables together. So didn't tell us much, um, however, I, um, as you can see here, I, uh, I, I put between brackets R, which is a software I like. Um, it's very easy, it's free, um, it's easy to learn, and I decided, you know, let's put in the data there and, and see how it goes. It, the good thing about the R is the visualization, so I just wanted to share a couple of outcomes here from the linear analysis about, um, uh, you know, the terrain. So as you can see, they seem to go further. Uh, if it's a flat area rather than the hilly, uh, the water was just in a couple of cases. And then, um, uh, as you can see, also the age bracket here between the 70 and the 80 and the 90, it's more dense in here. Um, and and they, they, like, there's no tendency to go far 
which is important in terms of flying a drone. And there's a lot of research been done for ground search, uh, but these factors still uh, helpful in terms of uh, flying a drone. Um, males tends to uh, travel further than females. And uh, finally, um, uh, this is the total uh, lost time, like how, how long they've been uh, lost. Uh, versus the distance from the, the IPP is the initial planning point. So this is where there's an evidence or a place where the person was last seen, which is their home, residence, uh, whatever that would be. Um, um, another way of analysis that's been used uh, uh, was the logistic regression. And, and, and this is a more like looking at the efficiency. Can we predict if that person would be alive or what is, um, 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 it's like machine learning. Can we actually do prediction through machine learning? But I also have to say the 3,272 incidents, not that much to train a, a, a model, uh, but it was good to kind of discovery. We have to, in that database that we, I had, I had to cut a lot of um, non really essential attributes and, and because it wasn't filled. So the way it was, um, it was um, uh, presented to uh, search and rescue teams, there was a lot of field need to be filled and honestly it, it wasn't. So it wasn't helpful. And I think, um, um, and I'm speaking to Melina, there's, a, there's a, an opportunity to kind of look at how we better can collect the data and provide input. Um, it's not my focus here, but I think it's, it's, it tells us um, um, uh, um, how, how can we, what is the best way to collect data that can help in, in a search and rescue operation. Um, the data was divided into 3070, it's a random division to train data, and um, we used some different models, random forest classification, uh, the SMOT analysis, which is the synthetic minority over sampling, and then the down under. And this is just type of models that we can do to train data. Um, the main thing that was uh, obvious is that the found, like the cases where they were found alive were so much larger than the ones that were not found, which create what we called in, in modeling is a bias because it tends to go to the yes, they were found, found alive. So it affects the accuracy of how we run the, the model. Um, the best one that uh, was, gave us the best accuracy was the SMOT model here. So um, uh, taking into consideration that and doing some uh, field testing, as I mentioned earlier, we looked at the drone efficiency as well. It's, it was interesting to see that actually battery life uh, makes a huge difference in the search. Um, doing the, like the, the, the searches that we've done a lot with police and, and so our teams, um, there's some actually um, uh, parameters and battery life came up because you can search and you can plan uh, theoretically to fly the drones for hours, but it actually cannot happen because you have to come back, even with a very expensive one that the police had, uh, that I, uh, you know, not my little DJI one, but the big one, um, there was a limit. And, and that in the design, uh, where I'm trying to incorporate that in the design of the algorithm, at some point you're gonna have to come back to base, recharge, and um, um, and fly again, and that was all captured. Uh, also, the time on screen because uh, there's no GPS, so my search is my scope is not using GPS. Uh, but uh, the time on screen can we actually recognize the person in a in a timely manner? The fl the uh, the pilot and flight manager experience were really important in terms of one of the best practices in SART, SART like when we did the the flight is. Um, the drone can always be where they can actually be seen. It cannot fly beyond that as a safety measure. So that's also provided a limit on the search circle. And, um, and that was an, an, a new parameter that needs to be considered um, in, in the design. And then um, based on the data, the terrain, the experience, and the total time lost for the um, inputs, uh, for the design. And finally, taking all this, uh, putting it together kind of in a, in a model. Uh, this is a pre pseudo code for um, an algorithm design. And 
taking into consideration the H ace here is 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 the hot spot where we're predicting that person would be. And, um, it's kind of this is what the algorithm that was given to the pilot for uh, 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 to 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 follow without anything again as if a recommender system for them. Um, and the flight manager who gave the instructions kind of operated as the algorithm at that time. Um, and so that, uh, that's it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this uh, work has been published, as I mentioned, in these two publications, uh, recent publications. And I will be hanging there to answer any questions you may have. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dalia. Um, so we're going to go over to Eleanor now. So Eleanor, if you could get set up sharing your screen while I introduce. Um, we're doing a big jump now. That was a really interesting, specific um, example of a type of technology. Now Eleanor is going to bring the debate a little bit wider and talk to us about kind of dementia and technology um, and try to encourage some debate. So Dr. Eleanor Bantry-White is a senior lecturer in social work in University College Cork. Um, fun fact, she just lives a couple of miles down the road from where I grew up, so it's a small world. Um, Eleanor developed an interest in supporting people living with dementia to walk outdoors and in technologies such as GPS during her doctoral studies at University of Oxford. And she continues to work on research on technology and on electronic monitoring. She also researches older people's engagement with their physical environments, specifically looking at the cognitive health and well-being gains of being outdoors. So, Eleanor, I will hand over to you. <coughs> Thank you. It must be about living in beautiful countryside that I like the outdoors and think everybody should be out there. So, as you said in this presentation, I'm going to take a step back from the actual technology itself. I'm hoping to create a space to look at what we do through electronic monitoring. So I'm using this term, so it's GPS, but it's other ways of monitoring and finding out where somebody is. Um, I guess what I want to do is we need to be able to unpack assumptions that inform these technologies and try to examine um, these assumptions in the social context that the technologies actually emerge from. So that's today, it's really maybe being a little bit provocative, but getting us to think a little bit about the motivations and the assumptions within the technologies. So that's my, there we go. Okay, so you can see the diagram, um, if you're not hidden by pictures there of, of people here. Um, this is a diagram really of intervention design. And of course, electronic monitoring in its different forms is an intervention that is placed on top of existing care practices. And this diagram makes intervention design look really neat. But in reality, we know that it's very messy. And at each stage of designing an intervention, we inject a whole host of assumptions. And I guess I'm just going to talk through a little bit about that now, because if we peel back right to actually trying to understand the problem itself, we know from some of the earlier presentations that being lost can mean different things to different people in different places. And meaning is important. We also know that risk is complex. We don't all agree on it. Um, we tolerate risk in different ways and we experience risk unevenly. The third point, um, I guess, is that while we have some good research and it's getting better, it is incomplete. And indeed, it will never be able to tell us fully how a particular individual will experience and be impacted by this issue. So it's always going to be complex, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So I guess um, we need to unpack how interventions knowingly and very often unknowingly reflect the cultural understandings from which they emerge and inevitably representations, biases, assumptions about dementia and wayfinding influence and shape what we design and how we use electronic monitoring. And in turn, these interventions can reinforce pre-existing assumptions and biases about dementia and care practices. So it's 
way, way beyond the scope of this presentation to look at the many ways that we understand dementia. And I know there's many people here who would be far better able to speak to that than I can. But it is nonetheless important to include this slide because a different intervention gets made depending on which narrative of dementia we have. Historically, the narrative has been very impressive and oppressive, and arguably it still is. So an intervention response based on that oppressive narrative will be very different from an intervention based on understanding the uniqueness and the inherent value of the person, their relationships, and re recognition really of our collective responsibility to support people living with dementia. So consider how different design functions might look um, in relation to, say, user control over whether they're tracked or not tracked, the extent of somebody's movement before somebody's alerted to them having moved outside an area, or indeed how much we care about the visibility of devices is about how much we care about how potentially stigmatizing um, these things can be and so on. Um, and so, um, Another, I suppose, area that I think is important to look at is understanding care assumptions. We also need to understand this because I'm not always clear who the electronic monitoring is actually for. Is it for the carer or for the person living with dementia or maybe a bit of both? And so we need to recognize that much of our understanding of care is based on those Western 20th century nuclear family norms that, of course, are highly gendered and tend to portray care work quite negatively. Care is contained within the family domain um, so that even spatially, the person's world shrinks back into their home and to a life lived indoors, something I worry about. And so we need to remember that something like electronic monitoring is implemented onto these existing care practices. So norms about caring influence the intervention design also. So questions like who will control the monitoring? Who will have access to the data? How far should a person be able to leave their area? And so on are all based on, I suppose, assumptions around how we um, understand dementia and how we understand what care should look like. So just moved on there. Did I move on too far? Sorry, there we go. So why does this matter? Um, because how we think about a person with dementia and the way they use their outdoor space and the people around them shapes what we do. It also influences the kinds of ethical dilemmas that arise in intervention, or at least our responses to these dilemmas. So exploring these representations, oh, uh, losing my slide here. Um, so exploring these representations help us to engage with our ethical responsibilities if we're involved in design. When we look about the debates about privacy, which of course is the central debate in, in monitoring, we must think about those historically negative representations of dementia. So in a sense, were people with dementia ever beyond a watchful eye of, you know, of a carer? Um, um, so were they ever free of sort of, we think back to locked doors and so on. So yes, electronic monitoring can certainly increase our sense of freedom and there's some good qualitative research emerging to support that. But is it the least worst option when historically those options have been so poor? As human beings, we all need private spaces. Our mistakes help us to grow. It's about inhering dignity of the person. And I wonder, is this privacy especially important for people living with dementia, where we know the narrative can mean looking for signs of failure? That potential for harm arising from a reduced privacy could be much higher than with other populations. We also need to think about the carer assumptions, coming back to care again. Is the carer now the watcher? And how does that change their relationship? What about the carer's needs? The carer who is now never off and always responsible. So even when they're away from the person, they're still having to check where, where the person is. What does that do to relationships? But I guess we also know the risks of getting lost and we want to ensure those risks are minimized. So is loss of privacy okay? Um, and if so, how much becomes too much? We need to think about these questions carefully. We know that negative assumptions about dementia can reduce our concern for privacy. 
We also know that the more something seems useful, the less worried we are about privacy. Think about all the times every day we click I accept online, for example. And we also know that that sense of duty to care can pull carers to keep the person safe at a very high cost to both themselves and to others. Another concern, and obviously it's an emerging debate, is thinking about datification. Um, we need to think about this to ensure that our, the data we collect does not get a higher value than listening to the person, to their account of what has happened, and to hear their experience of being lost, remembering the uniqueness of each individual. And so I probably end with more questions than conclusions, unfortunately, um, but it is about opening up a space for discussion. We develop who we are through our relationships and through the stories we tell about ourselves and about the people around us. And so how might electronic monitoring mediate relationships between people, communities and place, physical place? Our task is really to look at how we can align our technologies to progressive dementia practices. And so I conclude really by advocating a need for slow, reflective, inclusive spaces to build the good policies and regulations alongside the socially just technology. So that's really all more thoughts than actually presenting um, you know, hard research. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much, brilliant. Um, I think that's given us all a lot to think about and um, posed a lot of questions and um, if anybody has any ideas jot them down and we'll bring them back up and um, definitely making me think about my rusty start to this and um, hosting this seminar series and how that'll be recorded and for everyone to see forever but anyway let's see if I can redeem myself because I'll be sharing a video of um, the next presentation and um, so Next we have uh, Siobhan O'Connor. So she is a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh in nursing studies. She's got a really interesting background and um, it's quite multidisciplinary. Uh, so she has a degree in business information studies, but then she also um, is qualified as a nurse and her PhD was in health informatics. And she's interested in how technologies from telehealth to apps to virtual reality um, how can they be used to support people to self-manage any sort of uh, chronic illnesses? So, you know, as well as dementia, she's looking at asthma, diabetes, cancer, um, and how these digital health interventions can promote public health and healthy lifestyles. Um, and she's also interested in how the application of these technologies can help um, support nurses and um, nursing students. So... I'm going to just check. I think I might not have, I need to make sure the audio shares. Yep, share computer sound. I'll share video. Um, Nolana, I can't see anyone's face. So could you just turn your mic on quickly as we start mm -hmm. to make sure that people yep. can hear the audio, if that's okay? All right, here we go. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Dr Siobhan O'Connor and I'm based at the University of Edinburgh. For today's ICDW Summer Seminar Series, I'll be talking about health applications for people with dementia. As our time is so short today, I won't spend long on the background slide, but just to say there are currently more than 44 million people worldwide that suffer from dementia and this number is expected to increase in the years to come. Unfortunately, this neurological disease causes lots of physical, behavioural and psychological problems as it worsens over time and there is currently no cure. As a nurse myself, I'm interested in helping people with dementia and their carers to manage symptoms of this disease, particularly by using non-pharmacological interventions such as mobile technology, although I know the drugs do work quite well too. And as most people have smartphones or some mobile device with them these days, mobile health is a rapidly expanding research area with over 100,000 health apps on the iTunes and other app stores, including um, some for people with dementia. 
There is a really nice review by Bateman et al. from 2017 that looked at 60 different mobile apps for people with mild cognitive impairment, including Alzheimer's disease. And that review looked at the effectiveness of this type of mobile technology in improving various uh, health outcomes measured. Um, but the main limitation of this review is that it only looked at quantitative studies, mainly clinical trials. So the qualitative literature is missing, which prompted our review that I'll talk about today. So I got some funding from the Burdett Trust for Nursing to review the qualitative literature on health applications for people with dementia. One of my nursing students, Andrew Brown, helped me and we published um, the review this year. Uh, you can access it using that web link. And our review questions were, what are the experiences of people with dementia when using health apps? And what factors, both barriers and facilitators, affect the implementation of a health app with a person with dementia? We used a standard review methodology outlined below and a conceptual model called the Digital Health Engagement Model to help frame some of our analysis. So we only found nine studies that were all relatively recent, um, although we did screen out quite a few. The participants in the included, included studies were a mix of genders and ages, and most were diagnosed with mild to moderate dementia, so more advanced stages are missing. In terms of hardware, it was mainly tablet computers that were used, such as iPads. Uh, in terms of the software, which is what we were really interested in, the apps were a mix of ones that you could create digital objects and stories, some were interactive games, there was one navigation app, one app about therapy tools, and there was another app that had a whole host of different apps and functions on it. And there's a detailed table of all the uh, studies and the apps in the published review with the link uh, on that slide. So based Based on the first research question, we found three themes around the experiences of people with dementia when using health apps, and they were physical, mental, and social health. So the app seemed to improve some aspects of physical health, uh, such as cognitive function, like concentration. They also appeared to put the person with dementia in a better mood, particularly those that had a reminiscence aspect, or the app imbued uh, them with a sense of achievement, as some of the apps had a competitive or gamification function where you could score points or win virtual prizes. And they seem to improve a person's mental health. And finally, social health also seemed to improve as some of the apps facilitated conversation and interaction with family members. Um, an intergenerational aspect was actually mentioned in one or two studies where grandchildren found it easier to engage with a person with dementia and vice versa by using the mobile device. Uh, so that was interesting. And some of, the, some of the apps also seemed to encourage the person to participate in other activities such as walking or drawing. So overall, it was quite positive. Although one or two of the studies uh, mentioned that some of the people with dementia weren't interested in the technology or didn't find it particularly enjoyable to use. But overall, it was positive. So the second research question was around what factors affect people with dementia when they try and engage with health apps and mobile technology. And six themes came across in the literature review. You can see the model I mentioned to the left, which we used to underpin our analysis. And only some aspects of the conceptual model came up, as there were only nine studies in total in this review. So the first aspect was around the quality of the design of a health app or the mobile device. If it was well designed and the functionality was easy to use, then that facilitated engagement. The second theme centered on the quality of the information or content on the app and whether people with dementia liked this or not. The third theme was a per the person's own digital knowledge and skills. So those with better technical abilities found it easier to use the mobile technology, not surprisingly. The fourth theme we called personal lifestyle, and this was about whether using the apps fitted a person's day-to-day -day schedule and their activities. The fifth theme was around personal agency, so the amount of choice and control a person with dementia wanted over their health. And the last one was whether they were feeling well enough, either physically or mentally, to use an app on any given day. And there are more detailed descriptions and examples from the various studies in the published review if you want more information on any of these factors that affected engagement with this technology. As you can tell, the literature is quite small on this topic at the moment, but there is some qualitative evidence that people with dementia can have positive experiences when using health apps, although some issues hinder their engagement with this technology. The review we did did have some limitations, mainly it has a Western bias. 
being English speaking literature from wealthy Western countries. So some cultural or so socioeconomic issues that people with dementia experience in other countries may be missing. Uh, many of the studies had limited descriptions of the participants and the mobile technology, both the hardware and the software, which does make it difficult to understand if it works or not in some cases. And the biggest limitation of, of this review is that we only looked at the published science and we did not look at any of the commercially available apps on the iTunes or any of the other app stores. So a lot of apps for people with dementia are actually missing from the review. So for the future, we're interested in working with people with dementia and their carers as co-researchers so that we can jointly review user comments on existing commercial health apps for people with dementia, along with using an assessment tool called MARS to gauge their quality. And hopefully that piece of work, along with the, the two literature reviews that are already published, will help um, give us better knowledge around health apps and whether they're beneficial or not for people with dementia and what ones work for what reasons. Uh, these are all the references from today's presentation if you want to follow up on any of the reading. So that's a really, really, really quick <laughs> summary for me around health apps for people with dementia. If you're interested in this area, I'd really recommend you read the review by Bateman et al. from 2017. That's a great start and it's a much bigger review than our review. But hopefully our review, uh, Brown and O'Connor from 2020, is also helpful in terms of looking at more qualitative stuff. And in the discussion of those two reviews, there's lots of gaps in the evidence um, that we need to look at going forward. So just want to say a quick thank you to Kate and Olana for the invitation to speak today and apologies it's so brief but hopefully it's um, a useful starting point and also to the Burdett Trust for funding that piece of work. If you're interested feel free to drop me an email or get me on Twitter or indeed if you're in Edinburgh any day my office is just around the corner from this lovely plaza on um, Tivia Place. So thank you all for listening and um, I hope you enjoy it. Okay, um, so I think that presentation was interesting because um, it just gives us a sense of what the research literature actually says on um, people's experiences, people with dementia's experiences of using mobile apps. Um, and I think as Javon rightly pointed out, there's, um, there's a lot of resources out there that aren't in the, the academic literature. Um, so there's that to consider as well. Um, I think that presentation was, was placed to just encourage people to think that when we're considering dementia and technology, um, specifically relating to wayfinding, um, that we could think, think bigger and broader than just kind of um, tracking and GPS, even though we recognize that those are, those are important, uh, particularly for search and rescue. Um, and that that presentation was hopefully useful um, for app developers or people who are considering designing an app and um, the importance of um, co-designing, you know, if you're designing an app for a person with dementia, um, they are the experts after all, so um, why not use their expertise? Um, so following from that, uh, our final speaker is Tommy Petillo. Uh, Tommy is a product designer and he manages Alzheimer's Scotland's Dementia Circle which is a project that uh, finds, tests, and shares information about products, specific products um, for people with dementia. Today, he's gonna to tell us about Purple Alert, which is a community-minded app that helps to find a person with dementia if they go missing. So, Tommy, I'll invite you to share your screen. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, can everyone see it? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Looks great, Tommy. Looks great. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, Katie already introduced me. So my name is Tommy Vitillo, and I work on Purple Alert. Uh, for those of you who never heard of Purple Alert, I'm going to uh, quickly explain uh, how Purple Alert works. Um, Purple Alert is a mobile app. 
um, that helps um, the community get, getting involved in finding a person with dementia um, if they went missing. So if someone with dementia goes for a walk, um, their carer realize that they, they might be lost. Um, they, uh, after they call the emergency services, uh, here in the UK would be phoning 999. Uh, they have the opportunity to uh, send a purple alert. Um, and that means that um, all the information uh, related to the, the person with dementia would be shared um, with all the people within 30 miles radius from the uh, missing person's last seen location. Um, obviously, all these people would need to have the purple alert on their phone. Um, we never intended purple alert to be an absolute solution for uh, finding people with dementia. In fact, we like to think of purple alert as a, um, one um, a jigsaw piece that you can add um, to a range of jigsaw pieces um, to provide more independent uh, for the person uh, you are caring for. And that may be uh, GPS, CCTV, door sensors or Herbert protocol, and there's many more, more uh, to add to this list. Um, we launched uh, Purple Alert in 2017 in Scotland, in the UK. And since then, we reached uh, 10,000 downloads. Um, um, we had 25 missing alerts since launch. And out of those 25, three people were actually found uh, thanks to the app. Um, so we got a confirmation that the app worked exactly the way uh, we, we thought it would, uh, which was great. Um, the remaining uh, people found um, uh, that we, you know, of these 25 were found by the police. Now, since 2017, we've learned a lot because when we launched the app, we didn't really know, um, it, Purple Alert was just a concept. We didn't even know if it, if it was going to work, um, but it did work. And a lot of people um, downloaded the app. Um, we got really positive feedback, um, but we also learned a lot because there were a lot of things that uh, didn't didn't really work out. Or, um, so we redesigned the app completely. Um, and we redesigned the services around the app as well, just to make sure the uh, Purple Alert aligned very well with the existing services. Now, in just in the middle of um, the redevelopment of Purple Alert, um, COVID-19 um, swept across the, the world, really. Um, and um, we realized that there were additional challenges that we really wanted to address. Um, so there were a, a range of challenges, but we focused on two, which were the most uh, prominent ones. Um, uh, so we, we found out that the uh, COVID-19 caused um, a huge disruption of routine, uh, which caused um, a changed behavior in the person with dementia uh, and a lot of distress and that had a huge impact on the family, um, including the carer. Um, so what happened was that uh, people with dementia still went out um, because they still wanted to keep their routine. Um, so like a, um, a story of an old lady that uh, kept going out to, uh, to meet her friend for coffee. But once she got to the cafe, uh, to the, cafe the cafe was shut. And to add to that, um, the stress um, was that the, there weren't many people around to ask for help. So um, we obviously we, we then developed our brief further to include these challenges, and I will show you um, a little bit um, uh, how we address those points. Um, uh, the Scottish government gave us a little bit of uh, extra funding to uh, develop this part of the app um, because we wanted to build up on the existing Purple Alert community and we thought it was uh, a good asset uh, to use during COVID-19. Um, now, um, some of you may have seen Purple Alert, uh, the, the existing Purple Alert, but I'm going to share for the first time uh, the, the, some, some screenshots of the new app 
Um, we, we haven't launched the new app yet. We envisage it um, going live possibly in the next six weeks, uh, maybe eight weeks. Um, the new app has two main screens. Um, uh, one is a map. It's an interactive map that you can um, filter and you can find um, localized information um, so, um, like the men local dementia cafes or uh, Alzheimer's Scotland resource centers near you. Uh, the other tab is a um, community uh, information um, uh, page. Um, we envisage that being like a, almost like a, a tailored notice board um, and that is very quick, uh, quick to update for us. So it will be a question of updating the, the information regularly um, in the more in the most uh, meaningful way. Um, while we were developing the app, we came across a fantastic um, charity based in Scotland called Paths for All. Um, they have um, a fantastic map on their website that you can filter, and they organize these health walks. Uh, and some of them are dementia friendly, some of them are cancer friendly, and you can filter this map, and you can join their walks, which are uh, curated. Um, obviously, these walks are temporarily um, interrupted by, because of COVID-19 restrictions, but we envisage that um, um, going, uh, sort of being back on, up and running by the time we launch the app. Uh, so we are going to include some of these data in our map. Um, another quite um, a big piece of work we, we did uh, for the new app was developing, um, um, we call them toolkits. Uh, they are essentially a very um, um, easy to read step-by-step -step, uh, guidelines um, around you know what you can do before during and after uh, someone goes missing um, and uh, we develop those both for carers uh, so that they know what to do but also for the community that they use portal alert what is good practice and what you shouldn't be doing and uh, i will be the, all these will be shared uh, with you all uh, very soon um, uh, everything is coming together so hopefully in six Six weeks of the uh, everything I'll be able to share everything. Um, also, in the in the new app, I'll be able we, you'll be able to upload the Herbert Protocol. For those of you who don't know, the Herbert Protocol is a is a paper document that you fill in uh, with all the person with dementia um, information, and uh, when they if they go missing uh, and you contact the police you can hand uh, the Herbert Protocol to them. Um, uh, with a new app, you'll be able to upload this document directly in the app. Um, now, this is the bit that we added about the routines. Um, we, uh, when you set up a profile for the, the person you're caring for, uh, you'll be able to uh, insert uh, um, a routine. So for example, in this case, um, you know, if, uh, if Joyce was missing, uh, when you send an alert, people in, in the 30 miles radius will get an alert. Uh, they will alert them to the fact that Joyce would go maybe to the bingo every Wednesday afternoon. And if you happen to live near the, the bingo uh, palace, uh, you can maybe uh, go out and, and see if Joyce is out there. Uh, and we also included a button uh, to phone uh, 999 uh, which is the emergency services in the UK, because a lot of people uh, actually um, sent a purple alert before phoning the police. Uh, and we always stressed that uh, purple alert is not uh, an emergency service, but a lot of people get, um, I don't know, felt that they didn't want to bother the police. Uh, but we are really reiterating this uh, phoning 999 throughout the new app. Um, a lot of people also commented on, on missing occurrence uh, with very good willing messages, but um, these messages can be very distracting for someone in the middle of a uh, search. Um, uh, so we added a send love button, which is uh, a bit like a Facebook like, and hopefully people will rather send love than commenting uh, unless they have a, a very important message to share with their carer. 
Uh, last but not least, we um, included our return discussions button. Um, a return discussion, uh, so in, in Scotland, uh, in UK, uh, Police Scotland um, uh, will do, um, every time uh, someone goes missing, they will do a safe and well check. Um, but we wanted to uh, enhance that service. Um, so we, we added these return discussions right in the app. Um, a return discussion works like that. So if, if the person with dementia um, returns home, the family will mark them as found on the app. The app then will um, prompt the family to contact the local dementia advisor. Uh, this is Alzheimer's Scotland staff. Um, and within 48 hours, the dementia advisor will get back to the family uh, to organize a return discussion. Uh, the return discussion will be uh, designed to comfort the, the carer and reassure them, but also to debrief the, the missing occurrence and to understand what happened uh, in order to um, advise um, on preventing that from happening again. The dementia advisor then will uh, uh, compile all this information into an email and they will send the email to Police Scotland, which will upload all this information in their own national missing person database. And this is uh, uh, you know, strictly private to the police, but uh, what, what that means is that uh, if the very same person will go missing again, Police Scotland will have a huge amount of information uh, in relation to that person that they can, uh, they can act upon. I think that's me, thanks very much. And I'll be happy to answer any question. Thank you, Tommy. Um, okay, we just have a few minutes left for um, question and answer. Uh, what we've been doing, what we did last week is um, for anyone who is available to stay on um, for an extra 15 minutes, um, we will we'll keep the call open if anybody wants to have a discussion. But for now, is there is there any questions for any of the speakers? Um, you can either type them in the chat box, or if you want, you can just un unmute your mic and quickly speak if you find that easier. Just introduce yourself if you do. Well, I know that um, Christine Thelker, she had just left a comment for Tommy. She just said that she was wondering if there could be a way for a button to be added, Tommy, um, for people living with dementia to push if they need help. The idea of, um, of Purple Alert is really a, a, an app for the carers and the community. Um, uh, the idea behind the app is that the person with dementia won't need to necessarily carry any technology, any uh, tracking device or any, um, any phone. Uh, so it's the carer that will uh, send an alert out when they realize that the, the person is missing. Um, so we are uh, assuming that the person with dementia doesn't actually have their phone with them, because otherwise if they had the phone, uh, they would probably phone the carer or the carer would phone the person with dementia. Yeah, I think Christine, you've got your hand raised, Steve. Um, thank you, Tommy. That was fascinating and I'm really keen on that project. Um, one of the things though, as a person living with, um, and I live alone and I am really striving to stay alone and independent. So the reason for asking about the button is there is no care that is going to alert. And often, and I, and I do a lot of out and about, and I'm out in the woods and I'm all over the place. So it would be sort of the second part of that program if it gave me the ability to continue to do those things, but to know that I could hit a button if I found myself where I wasn't sure how to get back or whatever I was doing, that I could send some type of an alert that I needed help. Because there's a whole segment of us out there that live alone and we sort of fall through the cracks because everybody focuses on the, the partners 
and nobody looks at those of us that don't have any of those things in place. We don't have family, we don't have, so just some thoughts for everyone. It's a very good point and I will, I will take note of that because it's, um, yeah, absolutely. Just an observation on the chat as well. There's been a couple of questions about resources and um, we will be putting everything on the website. I don't know, Nolana, if you want to give a quick update on the status of the website. Um, yeah, so the website was finally ready for it to be populated. So um, Katie and myself um, and the others from University of Alberta, U Waterloo, we've been um, uploading everything. So by next week, it should be ready to go and we're gonna have everything there. So I'll be able to talk about it when uh, it comes back to my seat when I chair next week's session. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's Jamie here. Would I be able to uh, talk about Dyla? Or kind of? Of course. <laughs> yeah. Just your uh, observation, Dyla, about the uh, battery life of, of the drones. They're only good for maybe 20 minutes or you know up to 50 minutes. You, you have to remember uh, helicopters might only have a one or two hours of flight time when they arrive on station as well and then they're down again to go get fuel for a few you know one to two or three hours as well so your use of the drone although sometimes it's limited in the battery it's time on the searches is extended so it's, it's virtual Before we continue with the questions, I'm just going to uh, jump in really quickly um, because I know that some people have to leave. They might have other um, commitments at 4 p.m. So just a quick closing note to say thank you for joining us today. Um, we do have these webinars coming up, so please um, please register and um, next week we have uh, Christine who you just heard from she's going to speak about her experience joined by Paul Leah um, and the remaining um, webinars are going to address a variety of different topics so yeah just to summarize that I think that today has really prompted this discussion that technology can be great there's a lot of potential here but we have to be cognizant of how we're using it to push for it to be empowering and supportive rather than invasive um, so yeah, we please continue the conversation, but I just want to jump in to give permission to people who feel like they have to leave to leave. Um, and if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to write them in the chat, email us. Um, and yeah, if anyone wants to stay, stay on. I see Ron waving his hand. Hi, Katie. Oh. Oh, go, go on, Ron, and then after all, there's two uh, questions that have been waiting in the chat box. Okay, thank uh, thanks everyone uh, for presenting, uh, Tommy. Uh, Great work there um, on Purple Alert. I kind of knew about your work uh, three years ago um, through a good friend, Agnes Houston. Um, so um, I appreciate the work you're doing there. Um, and Dahlia, good to see you again. Um, uh, we're here in Toronto. Uh, for everyone who, does, who doesn't know me, I was a carer, a uh, caregiver, care partner to a dad that had Alzheimer's and dementia. And, um, and uh, actually my comment and question is for uh, Eleanor here. Um, and thanks for that great, um, I, I know how you describe it. It's not maybe, it might be creating more questions or more discussion, um, what you're presenting. And um, I do a lot of presentations to carers about people that go missing. And uh, I think, I love the emphasis that we need to kind of know who it's for. Like it's not just for the person that with dementia, you know, that's one piece and that's a priority. Like Christine, you spoke, um, good to see you, Christine. And yeah, we need to make sure you're safe, Christine. Okay, and we start off with you, no support system, you're on your own, you know, how do we keep you safe? So I appreciate, you know, that has to be covered. Then there's the other part where the concerns of myself as the carer, you know, um, is caring for my dad. So there's that piece. And then there's the diet. You know, I don't think we talk about the diet enough, that it's kind of together, but how, it's a relationship piece. There's trust that's needed with that, okay? Just because there's a care doesn't mean there's a trust relationship, um, you know, that uh, my dad might not want me knowing where he is, let's say, things like that. Um, so things like that. Um, but then there's the other piece of when does it become a concern, let's say, in the community, okay? So 
we have police services here. Okay, when do they take over? You know, and we're actually dealing with this situation with COVID right now. Okay, with the virus, it's like okay, who takes priority? You know, so um, I, I I appreciate the work you're doing. I'm more curious about your thoughts around the messaging uh, to people with dementia, to persons with dementia, to the carers, is that understanding of communicating the work we are we're all doing here. Okay, um, that communication of uh, how do we get better at that? Okay, um, with regards to knowing, okay, which lens you're, you're, you're doing this from, okay, because I've been around carers and they say, no, we, we're going to do this. And I have to stop them and say, okay, are you even thinking about the person <laughs> you're caring for? Their rights, the ethics, the privacy issues, all that stuff. Um, we had video cameras for my dad in the home. And some of you will see it in my presentation in two weeks. Um, but that, we, you know, we went over that with my mom and my dad and it, and I guess more my curiosity is flexibility. Okay? How do we communicate flexibility that there's no one right solution, it's not a perfect solution, and a combination to give the best success? So I just want your thoughts, comments, um, you know, coming from your side, from the research into the community, the knowledge translation piece, knowledge, uh, trying to get that out there. Really, really interesting points and I couldn't have made them better myself. Um, I think, um, yeah, you raise a lot in that in terms of, um, I, I suppose, and you talk about the dyad and I suppose it's not always a dyad, of course, as well. It's not always two people, but there can be that intensity oftentimes um, to, to the caring that there is a primary carer. Um, I suppose I'm slow to polarize the needs completely. I think sometimes we need to look at the separate needs of and the distinct needs of a carer and a person living with dementia, but they're not completely separate either that, um, you know, all human relationships um, involve sort of, you know, reciprocity, mutuality, um, and usually a concern for others. But as the sort of cynical social worker, which is my, my other life, um, knows that there can be very dark histories in relationships too. And sometimes care work can bring people too close as well. And so I think your point is absolutely right around um, flexibility. There isn't a one size fits all um, a solution. And what might feel um, like sort of surveillance to one um, person might be very different to, to somebody else. Um, and I guess um, we need to, I suppose, we need to understand, I suppose, the, the relationship context, the relationship history, issues of power in that relationship, um, and so on, and really open up those discussions and, and, and maybe that involves people outside of the, the immediate um, care network as well. I mean, something like, um, you know, GPS or something could actually be quite enabling in a relationship where caring brings them too close. It may enable the person and the carer to have more space from each other. And I remember talking, you know, with a carer years and years ago, and they sort of said, well, it's really hard to be day in, day out together because we always lived separate lives. So I think um, we can use technologies and other interventions to try and support ways that keep relationships healthy and keep relationships um, strong. Um, but as you say, it's facilitating those conversations. I think, I suppose I worry sometimes that technology can be seen um, as a solution for what could be wider stresses, wider um, issues. And oftentimes technology can be introduced in a context of limited resources. Like we don't resource care work enough. We don't value it enough. And so maybe it's, maybe it's other solutions that, are, that, are, that a person needs um, rather than just the tech solutions. So maybe it's actually that this person you know, that a carer has a right to an identity outside of the carer role and so on. So we need to understand what the motivations might be and slow down the conversation. I'm not really answering it, but I'm, I suppose I'm just trying to acknowledge what you've said in terms of it's about the diversity. There isn't a one size fits all. And really it has to be an individual, individualized response that promotes okay. open discussion. Okay. Thank you. And Eleanor, while you were speaking, someone had just asked what specific technologies you've researched. Um, I haven't um, looked at an, a specific technologies for quite a while. The original research would have been GPS when it was when before it was sort of integration to a mobile. Really, it was the devices separately that people carried, um, which caused lots of um, lots of issues. Some of them have been mentioned in in the track in the, the Zoom chat already. 
Thanks, Eleanor. We had uh, Christine Felker had a question about drones. Dali had to leave, but fortunately we have two other uh, other former or current police officers. So Mike and Jamie. Um, Christine, first, you want to ask the question? We'll see what Jamie and Mike uh, have to say. Yes, thanks. Um, Mike, I, I was listening to that presentation and some thoughts went through my head about do the police or has there been any thought of the police training um, people within communities that have drones, because we know a lot of people use drones these days, to assist police so that um, as a way to help with the limited resources of access to drones, for example, you have that two kilometer radius that they talked about, and then you're moving to another two kilometer. Can they train people within the community and set them up so that you're not having so much downtime recharging that you're coordinating with residential people to help you? We need you here at this location and we want you to scan this area and you can maybe do a broader area that way um, and it gets the community more involved and more aware um, and offers a, a lot of good things for people with dementia. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not explaining that very well at the moment. Um. Uh, Christine, I'll uh, jump in here first and then I'll let, let Mike add some in. And something when you're, you're talking at a search and rescue operation where you might only have 2.4 kilometers, in airspace that's a very small piece. So what the pilots have to know is where the flights of the other UAVs are going in the area, the altitude they are, the speed and, and all of that. So quite often for one drone, it sounds like a small, you know, a small resource or a small number. It's very effective to cover off that off in probably 30 to 45 minutes. So, because they're not searching the whole area where all the bushes and all that, they're only looking on in open areas, in areas where there'll be a high area of probability. So, that is the first factor that comes into play is, is the safety of, of the people below as well. Should there be an incident, should there be a crash? So quite often that's why it's the police resources that are deployed there initially because of that. And then there's the other aspect uh, that, so you don't want too many resources to hinder the operation. You don't want to manage the searchers versus managing the search, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. And then, and then when they get there, like, to, uh, it's good to say it would take a lot of training to have volunteers and we do, they do use volunteers in ground search and rescue and in air, actually, uh, the Civil Air Search and Rescue Association in Canada, uh, they, they are from a fixed wing from an aircraft from above are trained and it, it does take a lot of training and it's more than one or two days a year. It, it's quite a commitment to, to work together uh, to find that person, right? So. You, usually that one UAV is more than adequate to cover off a search. Thank you. Yep. Mike Adler, did you want to, uh, to add to that or we want to open up to, we have uh, questions for Tommy next. Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? I'm having some computer yeah, issues again. Uh, just, just to add to that, there's in Canada especially, um, I, I'm pretty sure that our government doesn't want a single drone in the sky. It's very restrictive as to licensing requirements. Um, there's two types of licenses you need um, just to fly a drone that's over you know, a very, very light weight. So from a liability perspective, if police are engaging people openly to assist them in the search, we have to consider that. Are they licensed? Um, what type of equipment do they have? What are the, what are the drones capabilities? And then ultimately, how do the police um, uh, measure how satisfied we are with an area that would be searched by a civilian? And that's part of uh, the search managers have to analyze and make sure that we haven't missed anything. And as Jamie added on to, um, it's it, a two kilometer area is not a, a large area, especially for open areas for a drone to manage. Um, the downtime is often mitigated certainly by our servers where we have multiple drones ready to go so when the battery dies uh, or starts to die on one we can simply raise another one and it can meet it up in the air 
So that's sort of our, 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 our concerns with, with engaging the public, especially earlier on into searches. Um, and then as Jamie mentioned too, having trained search and rescue operators as well, because there is a very dis uh, a big difference between looking and searching. And, and without those skills and that qualifications, um, we could miss something, which would be a concern for us. Thanks, Mike. Roger, do you want to ask your question to Tommy? Yeah, um, one a comment and a question. Um, I'm I'm thinking Scotland uh, is a real get it get it done kind of country. Uh, you you have things like the Herbert Protocol in place. Super impressive. Uh, you're about to launch this app, and and to me that's amazing because all over the world. Uh, there, it's so difficult to get a consensus uh, and, and buy it for something like this. And you're about to cross the finish line. So kudos to you. Uh, that's amazing in itself. But I, I'm, I'm curious about the, the process. Um, what I mean by that is uh, in Canada, we've tested uh, uh, similar things that you're proposing. And like, I'm curious with police forces, search and rescue, like I'm curious on where you've tested it. And the other thing I'm really curious about is, is are you getting buy-in from society with this? What I mean by say your Alzheimer's society, different societies promoting this app, uh, how's the government feel about this? Things like that. I know it's a mouthful, but uh, Care to comment? <laughs> yeah. No, well, thanks very much for your kind words. Um, it's been uh, it's been a long process. Um, so when we first started uh, developing the app, um, it was 2015. So it took us about 32 months uh, to put together the first app, and um, we tested it um, in Glasgow, Edinburgh. Um, and up north in rural areas to see if it actually works in different settings. Um, and then we launched the first, the first app. But when we launched in 2017, um, we only had about 100, and 100 people that had the app on their phone. So we didn't really do a massive launch because obviously the community wasn't there. So we couldn't really see all the communities out there looking out for you. Now, but the, the uptake from the community was actually quite big. Um, and um, so that was reassuring for us because um, it really um, validated all, all, what we were thinking. Um, so based on that, then we, you know, people just steadily started downloading the app. Um, and uh, only two years later, when we reached the milestones of 10,000 downloads, then we decided to uh, redesign the app with all the all the learning uh, we did. And, and to your point about linking up with other organizations, um, uh, yes, we are working with loads of different organizations. Um, the the I think the first um, the, the the main one is Police Scotland because they are the ones that really have the resources to look for people with dementia if they go missing. Um, but we also have local authorities. Um, so he, here in, in the UK, that there are, you know, I don't know how it works down where you stay, but local authorities are basically city councils, essentially. Uh, so they, they, when they get on board, they will get all their staff to download the app on their mobile phones. So that instantly makes an entire community a lot safer for a person with dementia if they go missing in that area. So, um, Again, we, we didn't really have a massive official launch yet because we really wanted to, to have the product working really well before we did. Um, so hopefully we, we will have a, a proper launch when we launch the, the second version of the app. I think it's just amazing, uh, you know, how far you've come. And uh, like I said, Scotland, holy cow. Uh, and, and you have a, 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 I'm trying to think of the word, 
a vulnerable person registry in Scotland? Well, I know that uh, the police have a, um, a vulnerable person database. Wow, you know, see all these things, uh, you guys already have it in place. Like, uh, this is amazing. Uh, way to go. That's all I got. I'll be watching with great interest, Tommy. It shows the importance of international collaboration and how we need to learn from what's going on so not <laughs> trying to re 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 redo the wheel. Um, so Tommy, we also, there was a lot of discussions a little bit earlier on um, just regards to asking about um, expanding Purple Alert. Have you ever had any thoughts about that outside of Scotland and even sharing it with other platforms like Nextdoor? Yes, uh, we have been working um, with uh, uh, Joe Apps that I believe is in the call. But anyway, we, we are hoping that this app will move down south in, in the whole of the UK. So uh, Scotland, England, Wales and, and Ireland and Northern Ireland soon. Um, and uh, of course, we are very, we would be very happy to, uh, to expand even further. Um, as I said before, if we want to make sure that the product is absolutely spot on, because at the moment it's still a little bit buggy and we've got a few things that we, we are still um, uh, fixing. So uh, we just want to make sure like, no, you wouldn't sell a table if, if it's got three legs. So we want to make sure that it's, it's proper stable. Where can we look at this or can we? Is there a link, that kind of thing where we could- Not, not yet. That Okay. I I, okay. I will um, you can you can see the the current app um, uh, on on our website um, a little bit uh, purplealert.org.uk um, but I can I can type it in the the chat um, but it's purplealert.org.uk but when we launch the new app we will we will make it uh, we will share it. That's great. Thank you, Tommy. Good job. Good job, Tommy. <laughs> um, I know that um, our other presenters had to go and, and said that um, they were happy to be emailed if anybody had any questions. So I guess before we wrap up, does anybody have um, any, any other discussion points they'd like to share? If not, we do have the final webinar at the end of the month. We're opening up to a large point of discussion. So if we have any burning questions or anything like that, it's literally going to just be open for us to be able to chat about everything we've learned. Or things that we I really doing. think for me personally, a learning point of this conversation has been that we, we say technology and it's such an umbrella term and, and even specifically related to, you know, helping persons with dementia with with wayfinding, there's technology that supports search and rescue, there's technology that supports the person with dementia, there's technology that supports the carer, and and they're all different, but also they shouldn't exist in silo because there's um it's important for them to all be related. So I think it's a really, really complicated area. And yeah, I think that this is just a real scratch the surface of, of the types of things that we could talk about. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And please join us next week. I think next week is going to be the highlight of the whole webinar series. Um, and um, yeah, we'll see you then. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.